Hello everybody! Welcome to another day of Chess on Psychology. Hope you're having a great day. Um, so far, I'm having an alright day. Uh, it's kind of rainy here, but it's not stormy, so I'm good. As long as I'm not uh, jumping up and down the thunders, I guess that's a that's a big plus. Okay, so today I decided to show you um, one of my favorite games that I played in. Um, it wasn't. Uh, I don't remember the city, but I was playing the Switzerland Bundesliga in seasons 26, uh, 15, 16, and then 16, 17. So I had some really interesting games there. I actually scored 100%, which was a pretty cool deal for me. Um, let's see, what else? What did I like? Ah, I actually, back in 2015, considered uh, living in Switzerland and like changing my federation to Switzerland, but um, I had some issues with language barrier and kind of ended up wanting to live um, permanently in an English-speaking country. So that didn't happen. <laughs> but this was a very interesting game because I specifically have been wanting to talk about not just how to beat weaker opponents or how to prepare against opponents or how to play against like much, much higher rated opponents, which those are some of the things that we have been talking about. Uh, in our chess and psychology recently but whereas I kind of want to show how to um, beat an opponent that is almost exact same level as you are so I think that's a big deal because um, a lot of the players have this issue even myself have this issue that not necessarily we always know how to play or what opening to choose or just what does an opponent who is maybe like uh, around our rating or our strength knows? Uh, how much chess he knows basically. So for me when I'm playing like 200 less, 200 more, um, I kind of have a clear idea of kind of what to expect when, I, when I'm playing something like that difference. But when the difference gets closer to like 50 points or somewhere mm, even less than that, then it's uh, kind of, it's really hard to figure that out. So in this specific game, I was playing against, um, okay, good luck, good, wish me luck with my pronunciation skills, uh, Hotch, Hotches, Terrasser, Michael, oh god, <laughs> uh, who was, I think, a FIDE master or international master, um, with the rating 2330 in 2016, and I was 2016 earlier in uh, 2016 January, so I was still just the WIM, and my rating was 2315. And yeah, January was a good month. So, um, ah, yeah, this was right after Christmas. I remember I played Qatar Open in 2015. And I flew directly, I went from Qatar back to Iran, switched suitcases, <laughs> and flew to uh, Switzerland. And my mom and my brother were already in Switzerland, and we um, had the New Year Eve there, which was actually kind of nice. Yeah, I kind of missed hanging with my family. Ugh, we need, I need my family's immigration case to process faster, right? <laughs> okay, um, so non-chess stuff aside, let's talk about the chess behind this event. So um, I was playing for, um, I think it was the first year that I was playing for this uh, Switzerland High League and I ended up uh, winning all my games that I played and um, we actually won the, uh, the title for the first time. But, okay, so my main opening is Nimzo Indian um, with against d4 c4. I tried King's Indian, which I showed a game last time. Um, I kind of tried the um, Queen's Gambit, kind of not really my style either. Um, I tried some Grunfeld. I mean, I like it, but it's um, still f I, it's not that comfortable for me. So. 
Nimzo Indian it is. So, um, for those of you who play Nimzo Indian, you know that um, this E3 is um, kind of a big deal because you have to know exactly what you're doing. So, the thing with E3 is that there are so many different lines now. Uh, one of them is to take. I prefer to take only after this a3 has been played because without this a3 then this bishop a3s um, could potentially be a little bit annoying in my experience um, but ideally I would like to have this um, to it's this double pawn and this is something that we've covered previously how to play against this um, these double pawns so a lot of the players prefer to do castle and uh, then later on, if necessary, they bring their bishop back to e7 or um, if they have to, they take on c3. So it, it really depends on um, we, it kind of depends on what we're looking for in that game. So my favorite used to be the c5 just because of this knight e2 line. The only difference between uh, the only big difference between doing castle or c5 earlier is this knight e2. So, when you do c5 earlier and after knight e2, you get the chance to actually take on d4. And th this was what I wanted to get at. Um, so, finally, we get the chance to castle. So, so far it doesn't look like um, we have like any clear plan, right? So, if you don't know this opening, at first glance, you're gonna probably think, okay, mm, everything seems somewhat of an equal. We got king safety, white got some center and some space. Um, what else can we think about? We could consider the fact that this bishop is still underdeveloped, so we should try to um, figure out what to do with this bishop. One of it could be try to fianche to it, another is trying to do d5, another idea could be d6, e5. So you kind of have these three options on what to do with your bishop. Um, it kind of depends on what white does, because, well, a3 is one of the main lines. Another main line is this idea is with bishop f4. Um, and with bishop f4, this kind of delays your d6, e5, right? So you can't really do that as easily. So that's one thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, I see in the chat that you guys are kind of looking for tactics. Unfortunately, this game does not have much of tactics in it. Just because, um, well, white kind of prevented it with the e3 and knight e2. If I didn't do the c5 and if I just played like very uh, slowly, slowly, then the idea behind knight e2 is that eventually wants to get this f3 e4, not right now, but eventually, and the knight is not on f3 to block it. Another idea that could be out there is um, just with the knight on e2, this knight f4s and d5s could become a little bit more supported compared to having the knight on f3. So those are some of the general things to keep in mind when thinking about e3 and choosing what you want to do as black. So my opponent played a3, bishop e7, just because, well, I don't really want to take this anymore, it just takes with knight, and I just gave up my two bishops, uh, the center is still mobile, and I don't really feel like this is um, going to be a very easy game for me. So let's go back play bishop e7, bishop f4, uh, sorry, knight f4. Uh, bishop f4 is also possible, but it kind of like you have to figure out what you want to do with this bishop to be able to castle. So I don't think bishop f4 right now is the smartest choice. Yes, this bishop would uh, would be pretty, would look pretty good on uh, this diagonal because it has so many squares. But um, at the same time, bishop on f4, you're blocking this knight, you're delaying your development, you're delaying castle. So let's not try to do that. Let's go for knight f4. And so my first question to you guys, what do you want to do with this bishop? You have some choices. You have those three choices between d5, d6, e5, or b6. So what do you guys want to do? Do you want to um, simply play b6, you want to try 
D5? What do you want to do? Okay, I have one B6. Ooh, I have one D6. I wish I kind of had a pole right now. But did not prepare that. Oh, I only have one D5. Interesting. So, to, for those of you who are suggesting d6, I assume that you want to follow up with e5, right? So I think that's interesting, I think that's a good idea. Um, so I chose d6 with the idea e5. Uh, d5 is also possible, I am not the biggest fan of b6, just because then bishop e2, bishop b7, and now castle. And um, sooner or later, there's your bishop is gonna get close because you are, you kind of have to try and get this knight out either with d d5, um, or you're gonna close your bishop either with d5 or with your knight. If you decide to do d6 knight d7, then what is the future for this knight on d7? So um, yeah, let's try to figure out how to develop. So I think those were some big things that I um, considered trying to decide who, well, where to develop and um, okay so I went for d6 with the idea e5 and um, the knight could end up on e4 but the problem is that even if you do like with these knights here this d5 is something that's always going to be bothering you so that's something that's I didn't really want to deal with I just wanted to get my bishop out uh, this way without having to deal with the fianchettos that would also weaken some of my squares okay so um, in the game my opponent went bishop e3 so do you guys think right now we should play d e5 keep in mind if you play e5 take take uh, the queens could get exchanged Oh, hello. I'm good. How are you? I think I have cat hair on my face, but besides that, I feel quite good. It's one of the perks of having a cat. The hair gets everywhere. I find it on my face. Fun fact, with when you have a cat, you might want to invest in lots and lots of lint rolls, because actually lint roll my face I, I didn't say that I don't lint roll my face right but yeah that's actually the best way to um, get rid of the cat hair <laughs> uh, gets in the mask gets on the laptop but yes uh, but I, that's something that I have to um, talk to my cat about stop shedding okay uh, we are looking into e5 okay so I have um, ah, interesting so we have something um, to try to do like queen b6 huh interesting so I think queen b6 is mm, I think queen b6 would be quite nice but the thing is with queen b6 you're not really threatening this b2 because uh, let's say Bla uh, white just plays bishop d3 then are you actually going to take this because then knight a4 and your queen is getting trapped so I don't really think it's a um, it's a good idea to play queen b6 just because you're not threatening anything if it actually had a serious threat then yes I would I would like it mm, let's see so let's say we do something just very chill and we simply just develop so I think um, knight uh, c6 is interesting, but the problem is that this d5 is coming up. So either you're gonna have to deal with uh, this d5 by taking it. Ideally, we would want to play e5 instead of taking, because when you take and then, well, anything take back is, I like it anything even, even pawn I think is fine now knight e5 and the, you're having some issues with this bishop it's kind of 
and blind it. Um, what else can we think of? Um, yeah, well, you could try to develop this bishop. You, that's like you could think about that, but I like just looking at it. I want to be white. I don't want to be black in this position. So I prefer this uh, not to be. I don't want to get into this position. I don't want to have to um, wish that I was my opponent. You know. Um, so in this position, we can play something like e5. Uh, but still, with e5, then yes, you open up this bishop. But you're still having issues with your dark squared bishop. Let's say if take. Take, can I take on b7? You take back, take here. Ah, now I kind of feel like black is doing alright because we have this rook e8. Mm. Bishop is kind of grounded. So, yeah, I think actually this does give black some interesting chances. Um, but what about just taking back on. on um, f4 because if we take back then take back and I don't know this position still feels too wobbly so yeah I don't I want to be I don't want to deal with this pressure I prefer to be the one who's putting the pressure um, even just psychologically it's going to be a pretty hard game because I'm not really going to be able to do this uh, d5, like, okay, let's say if we play d5 now, it's not really threatening anything, yeah, maybe you could do d4, but then the knight, I, it's white's activity, white's pieces coordination, white's um, putting the pressure, so I don't really um, like this, and, alright, so, that is another reason why we, why I didn't really want to do this knight c6 and why we should be committed to this e5. So after e5, it's very important to understand this pawn endgame. So, uh, sorry, the pawn structure of this endgame. So um, as you can see, it's a, it's a kind of a um, minority. A majority type of deal. So white has this pawn majority on the queen side and we have this pawn majority on the kings. I think I'm having some um, problem with words. And uh, so let me reorganize my thoughts. This is a type of pawn structure that we are going to get uh, in a lot of different positions from a lot of different openings so it's really important to understand the concepts of how to do the pawn majority attacks because right now white has this majority in um, in queen side and black has a majority in the king side and so it kind of means that if we kind of like wait long enough then white is going to just start pushing start pushing and since white doesn't have a king here uh white doesn't have to worry about um weakening his king however because we have this majority on the king side if we start pushing then we are actually going to be worried about what to do with our king so um in this position, white made the good choice of playing knight d5 because if white did anything else like knight d3, we're just going to develop and you can see that black's pieces activity, pieces coordination, we have better, so means we're doing better. Uh, now like, like white actually has to play it a little faster, like if white just plays super chill with bishop e2, now we're gonna go start um, attacking these pawns. If you just keep on playing chill, we're just gonna keep on pushing and pushing. So, okay, so knight d5, question for the audience. 
how do you guys want to continue in this position? What do you want to do? Do you want to take something? Do you want to just move your bishop? Um, what do you think? I'm reading the chats. Oh god, you guys are really killing it, huh? So, I see one knight c6, hmm, knight c6, um, so are you willing to give up this bishop, like, because we do, we would benefit from having our two bishops, so, I understand that you want to develop, but at the same time, we kind of have to take the knight, like, I don't think, it's, um, it's just one of those moves, you have to do it, not because it's um, not because it's the only move, but because um, we kind of have to do this. <sighs> because if we don't, then we're gonna have some issues. Like it's not that it's the only move. Like if you don't do it, you're gonna lose. Like knight c6 is still not that big of an issue, but the problem is that in a long run, you're not going to benefit from this move. Also something with like moving your bishop to cover up c7 as well, because knight c7 was coming. Then you're still not going to benefit from this pawn structure, or even something simpler, c5. Now attacking the bishop. So, okay. Um, let's go back to... Exactly, knight c7 is trapping the rook, so that's why we also have to seriously consider taking. Um, another thing is that you just don't want to, in this specific position, you don't want to give up the tempi. Like, if you are going to give up two bishops, then it's better to um, have one bishop, one knight for the two bishops, instead of like letting your opponent keep one knight. Because then that knight can still jump around, but if you are the one who has a knight, then your knight is stronger than... So if you have two knights, one bishop, compared to two bishops, one knight, that's usually not um, as good as having... Again, depend on the position, but it's not usually as beneficial to have that compared to like one knight on the board that is yours, and two bishops, one opponent, one bishop you. So... Um, I think that's something to, um, like, just keep in mind. Okay, so, I hope I explained that well, because, um, I guess if I didn't, I'm gonna hear back from you guys. Okay, so, take, take, and in this position, we kind of have to, um, play this knight c6, because, unfortunately, if we play bishop d6, then we have to play, then we have to face the c5s. And the little tactics of taking doesn't work. Well, actually, this does work. But just taking right now doesn't work because of simply knight c7. And then, oops, your rook is trapped. And we don't really want to have that, right? So, uh, can we isolate the c pound somehow? Well, ideally, yeah, that's the goal. We want to try and isolate that. But right now, it's quite hard to do just because, well, how are you going to get rid of the b2 pawn? So knight c6, take, take, rook d1, so question, shall we take that rook or should we just mm, develop this bishop? Okay, yeah, let's take. I agree. We gotta take that. And now, okay, so now we are actually in a critical position. 
How are you going to develop your pieces? Where are you going to place your, um, well, the remainder of your material? You don't have that much of it left. So, where? How are you going to um, develop? Where are you going to put the bishop? Where are you going to put the knight? Ow. Bishop f5? I think bishop f5 is interesting, but we have to make a choice. Do we want bishop f5 or knight f5? Yeah, see, if you... Mm, not necessarily. If you play knight c6, then, well, you kind of wasted a move. You just played knight c6, and then you took on e7, and then you came back. Well, actually, you wasted two moves. So... Um, yeah, we can play this knight f5. Also, also, uh, didn't you guys uh, say, uh, tell me about trying and attacking this guy? So we could achieve that with bishop e6 and potentially knight d6. So why not? Yeah, let's go with knight f5. Um, in the game, I saw this idea and I really wanted to go after it. Also because bishop f5, just you're not really like your bishop is taking away the d3 square from this bishop. Okay, true, I agree. But still, bishop can come here, can go to f3. It's not really doing that much good, and you really need to activate this knight. The, the if you are going to get an advantage, if you're going to have the upper hand, it's going to be because of this knight, because you have this. Um, because you have that, that knight. Because that's what your opponent doesn't have. So that's um, that's kind of another type of reasoning. Because you got that knight, you gotta activate it. So, knight f5, king d2. So what are we gonna do? Are we going to take this guy? Do you think it's right to want to uh, pick that up? While you are thinking about this, what to do after king d2 I'd like to point out if white just tried to develop I would definitely take this especially because it would kind of mess up the pawn structure bishop f5 and we're gonna everything is getting out so fast the bishop f5 rook d8 and I'm not saying that this end game is like winning for black but this is definitely better for black just the activity of the pieces and the fact that, well, your bishop is kind of, it's not really doing anything. You, you can't even play bishop f3 because you get this rook d3. So, yeah, exactly. Yep. So that's why um, I would definitely, uh, I would be very happy with this, how the things are going. And I would just, now it would be the right time to push, right? And now um, we're just gonna try and simply bring in the king or play like a b3, b6 to um, face potential um, scrutinies there. But I kind of prefer to bring the king to be honest. Okay, anyways, let's go back. Unfortunately, my opponent didn't do this king, uh, bishop e2 and did king d2. So now, now what? Shall we take that? Um, from the most of the chat is saying no. Yeah, I agree. If we were to take this, then black, uh, white would take with king, and the king is not activated. And now the bishop is also coming to d3. Yeah, you can play this bishop f5, but then bishop e2. The king is way too activated. Just comparing the king makes me very sad. So we don't want to help our opponent activate his pieces. Rule number, well, one of endgame. Actually, maybe you're, yeah, between having a pass pawn and activating the king, both of them should be rule number one, right? Okay, um, so if we're not going to take, then what are we going to do? We have to develop, right? So let's get the bishop out. Let's start putting pressure. Um, so I don't really think there was any other good ideas but like I don't see anything much better from bishop e2 I think like bishop d3 is also possible but we would still do this rook d8 with the idea e4 
Now, uh, if when you move the king, um, well, if king e2, now I would still have. Ooh, I kind of want e4. Can I do that? This looks pretty. Ugh. Uh, this looks interesting, but even if I don't really want to do this e4, I could still just try with this. And now my pieces are also active. Well, kind of more active compared to yours as well. My rook and my bishop. Uh, then my king is coming out as well pretty fast so I do like this I would go for this if bishop d3 but bishop e2 I think rook d8 is very um, just I don't think anybody would do anything else besides rook d8 it's a check it pushes the king away and it gives us the chance to um, kind of mess with the pawn structure so question shall we mess with the pawn structure so should we take on e3? Or do you think your knight is generally better than that bishop and you don't want to do that exchange? Another thing to think about when we are trying to make decisions about exchanging stuff is um, converting advantage. So if you think you have a spatial advantage or peace activity advantage, even if it's just a tiny advantage, uh, you can always convert it to something bigger. The way I think about it is I am not a big physics fan, but I always understood and kind of respected the uh, the law of physics that the energy conversion stuff. So, if you are a nerd and you like physics, first of all, whoa, good for you. Second of all, um, I think that's that's the easiest way to understand converting advantage, converting energy. Well, I guess the problem is with advantage, you can blow it up, you can just blunder it away, but with energy you can't, so I guess there is a flaw in my idea, but eh, let's, we're, we don't, we are strong players, we don't blunder, right? Okay, so, um, just thinking about the advantage, we are going to convert our advantage, uh, which is minimum of just spatial and activation, to weak pawn. Now the biggest question is, okay, we converted this advantage, but how are we going to use it? Because we have to be able to use this advantage, otherwise what, what, are, what do I want to do with an advantage? Put it on a shelf? I, I have to be able to use it. So, now what? What is Black's follow-up plan? The one thing is certain, you gotta get the king out. How? Also, it would be pretty awesome if the bishop was already on e4, but, well, I can't dream. So, question to audience. Black to move, what is your plan? Even if you don't have an uh, exact move order, having a plan would be beneficial. Let's see what is the chat saying. from the chat. Am I? Huh. Well, either you guys need coffee or my... I'm not fully up to date it. Um, maybe give me a thumbs up or something if you are. If everything is alright, because I'm getting a little worried. As you might be aware of, I've been experiencing some um, internet difficulties working from home, so... I'm a little worried I'm not seeing the chat, but let me just reload the chat. Okay, so it is up. You guys just need more coffee. It's okay. We can... You can go get your coffee. We can just talk about it. Right? I wanted some answers. Okay. Um, so, the best way to try and... Um, somehow just advance our position is with F5 at this point. It would be ideal if this bishop was on e4, but it's not realistic, like, you don't have enough time. It's very important to, um, to keep the tempi, to not lose time, to just, to be able to actually, um, 
use your pieces of activity because uh, one thing that uh, I learned mm, quite well in my younger years it was the concept that something like activity something like um, just peace coordination are very um, fade away very fast so you're either going to be able to they're dynamic so you're either going to be able to use them fast quick get them done or most likely you're going to um, convert them to something more permanent such as this pawn for example or on um, most cases you might just lose them and you might just not have that dynamic advantage anymore so because it's not permanent you have to try and use them ASAP so push uh, I think that's what my opponent had in mind as well with c5 I do still think something or maybe rook d1 was more interesting just because um, with rook d1 now um, I can't use this pawn as much as I would like to, as much as if I had the rooks on the board. And just thinking about this position, nothing else. My rook is better than your rook. So, you should try and get rid of it. Which you won't achieve with c5, with rook d8, with rook d1, you would achieve that. And it is my best move to take, take, and to be completely honest, I have absolutely no idea how to win this position. I know how to play it, but I don't have like a cookbook of, okay, you do this, you do that, you're going to win this. I don't think there is much strategy of um, how to win it, whereas how to play it and kind of hope for opponents to not play it as accurate as I would. So my future moves in this position would be a combination of trying to do b6, trying to get this king up as soon as possible. Um, I'm still undecided on whether or not I want g5. It kind of depends on what the opponent does. But the one thing I know is I kind of want to slow this pawn. So I would potentially play b6. And now if you go b4, I'll get the king out. Uh, if you do c5, then take, take. And I kind of want bishop d5. But maybe let's just bring in the king. Let's be on the safe side. In this, was, in this situation, yeah, I definitely want um, g5. But... Okay, let's go to our game. So in this position, my opponent played c5, and this c5 is kind of giving me a new um, target to go after. So immediately, rook c8, let's go put that pressure. Um, now b4 is kind of like the only move, and one thing that I'd like to mention is b6 is... Um, definitely worth thinking about it kind of feels weird right because if b6 then uh, take take okay i can't understand that we kind of got rid of this strong pawn but if not it, what if my pawn just pushes this pawn well this is a super weak pawn now i just have rook c8 and soon enough i'm going to pick this guy up so i'm not really worried about that i would be worried about maybe b4 and take, take, um, rook c8, king b4 pretty much only move, let's throw that check in there, if king a5, king a5, now my rook is getting in there, so like, I kind of exchanged my rook activity for your king activity, so I think it's, um, also a matter of taste, I wasn't willing to do that, I didn't trust my rook enough, or I don't trust well, myself enough to want to um, allow my opponent that much of an activity. Maybe a super GM will have a different mindset than I did. So, um, in the game I took, oops, in the game I played rook c8. I do remember playing b6 later on. And, okay, let's get the king out. So, in this position, my opponent played bishop c4, but I do think rook d1 was a better choice. Just rook d1 kind of gives a little bit more to white's position, because if you were to play rook d1, and then I play something like b6, now you do bishop c4, or even like bishop a6, it kind of feels um, a little bit stronger. 
which obviously doesn't serve that much of a purpose because the only idea is that I'm gonna get you to move the rook so I can play bishop c4 and if you take it now I'll just take it with the king now okay now I actually don't want to be black the king is activated the rook is activated okay I, we shouldn't take that we should however take on um, c5 which will be followed with b5 and now this is the isolated pawn but it's an extra pawn so a lot of trades off trade-offs oops English issues well so anyways in the game I find with bishop c4 and I'm gonna try the chat one more time you guys have been very quiet mm. so let's think what, what should we do in this position? Should we take on c4? Should we play something like b6? Should we just ignore it? I think this is the longest silence I've ever faced on the live stream it's a little scary I feel like in one of those horror movies everything is silent and then scary scene but okay so um, I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit more about this endgame um, so I think the two main candidates are either take or b6. So it's kind of like a matter of, uh, well, of um, figuring out which um, which one would you prefer. And I got a message from Miss Tracy to refresh my chat. So you guys, ah, never mind. So it was my chat all along. Nice. Well. Kind of good to know. I wasn't being ignored. Ah, oh, thank you. I was looking at the YouTube chat. I just couldn't. I don't know why it wasn't updating for me. Kind of good to know. I'm um. Ah, it's nice. Ah, oh, good to know. I wasn't getting ignored. Okay. Um. Okay. So um, now that I have your attention. Ooh, Malaysia. Nice. Okay. So, what do you want? B6 or taking on C4? Um, so... So, uh, to answer a question on why we're not trying to get... Uh, pass pawns in the center. We do want to get pass pawns, but we also want to eliminate opponents from having those pass pawns. So if I were to play something like g5 now, then I would give my opponent a chance to play rook d1, which is going to be followed with rook d7, because this bishop is pinned, and this is not pleasant. So we shouldn't, we should advance our position, but even more important than that, we shouldn't give our opponent the chance to um, advance his position. So as long as I keep my opponent um, kind of like paralyzed or just unhappy I'm I'm happy with that as long as my opponent is unhappy don't quote me on that <laughs> but, but uh, chess wise let's go with chess wise okay um, so that is why we should we are only thinking about taking on c4 or playing b6 so let's think about taking on c4 I get it it's kind of weird now you're at helping your opponent's king whoa but the idea is that because this rook is not in d1 yet, now I'm going to um, do this rook d8. So now I get the um, I get the file, and it's very important because now there's only one open file, so having that is very beneficial. And now. The thing is, well, what's gonna play like this rook c1, we're gonna get the king, and it's still a fair game, like, it's not like white's winning or black is winning, but I do think that, in the game at least, I thought that b6 is going to benefit me more, because just b6, the idea was kinda clear, 
Well, I'm attacking your pawns, and I'm attacking your bishop, but you can't take because you lose the bishop. Um, you can't really take here just yet, because I am still going to continue putting more pressure on your guy. And I would end up take, take, I kind of want to say her b8, her d8. And I'm going to start basically harassing your pawns. So, okay, that was my idea behind b6. After b6, white's best move is to go for rook d1 and still follow up with the idea. Now, black move, what do you think we should do? Should we already just take on c5? Should we play like the king e7 to cover d7? What should we do? I do want to do g5 too, but I have to stabilize the queen side and uh, def defend my center first. Ah, I see a lot of king e7s. But the problem with king e7, I think king e7, um, what if take, you take back and then rook d6 check. And I think that's a serious, um, it's at least unpleasant. King e7, ooh, a lot of king e7s, guys. But then check, and then just king comes to c4, and you see, white is much, much active, more active. So, uh, I, yeah, I don't want this position. Nope. If there was no king c4, then okay, maybe, but king c4, and then this guy's coming here, all oh, these guys are set, the king is cut, yeah, no, no, thank you. I'll take my chances with b takes c5. So b takes c5, rook d7 doesn't necessarily work because I have king f6 and you don't have rook d6 because of this little check over here. And then we take on c5, uh, c4 for free. So rook d7 doesn't necessarily work. However, b5 kind of does. b5 is the best move. And um, so b5, now white's wanting to create a pass pawn over here. However, having an extra pawn in the end game, especially in this end game, is beneficial because we're also kind of paralyzing the king. So, my idea is, um, well, I just want a pawn. I don't want to allow rook d7, so now let's do king e7. Um, my opponent took, take back. King c4. King c4 was also crucial because if not, then I might want to do c4 myself. So king c4, keeping my pawns at bay, and okay, finally, finally we push pawns. Like we had the chance to push this g5, um, maybe five, five, six moves ago, but um, it wasn't the right time. We needed to do preparation. So we did the preparations, we did the g5. So now it's it feels like it's a pawn race, like white's gonna keep pushing over here, I can't really stop him, I don't know if I want to stop him, uh, and I'm gonna keep pushing over there. So, e4, or f4, or g4, so what do you want? I don't think anybody actually wants g4, just cause g4, g3 and kinda stops it. So let's, uh, let me just scratch that, do you want e4 or do you want f4? I see a lot of F4s. Whoa. Only one E4. Hmm. I mean, I feel like... So, it's kind of... It's really important to try and figure out well, which two pawns are you going to keep. So, let's say if you were to play F4, um, the main thing that you would have to deal with is this E4. Because E4 kind of closes the square and your king is kind of um, not having the best day of his life. So that's why I chose e4, because, yeah, e4, uh, then I would have to deal with the potential g3s. And I can't just push because, well, I mean, I don't, I'm gonna give the pawn back. And um, king f5, there's rook d5s. Uh, take. Well, I don't want to take, but rook d7 coming from behind. This is possible. This would still kind of um, be interesting to play. But, um, I do feel like e4 would give black more chances than f4. 
F4, I mean just E4, and I don't really know how to advance. So yes, yes, I can play G4, and yes, I can try to push F3, uh, but ideally I want to have these two pawns, so I kind of want to have these two central pawns. So, E4. However, in the game, my opponent was uh, a little in rush, and he just played A5, which I thought, well, why not? I'm gonna push. And, um... He started playing inaccurately. So in this position, he had to either take it and take back, play rook e1, which I would follow with king e5 because there is no more rook d5 check. And I really, really like this position, to be super honest. Um, or after f4, he had to play rook, e, rook f1. Now if I take it, okay, taking is not really good because just rook comes back, we take, and then e4 is also under pressure. But. So, the two best moves for white is either to take or to, oops, not that, to play rook f1. In the game, he still kept on rushing after f1 and played b6. Now, well, after b6, I do have to take it, that's out of the question. And now, what to do with black? Should we take? Should we push? Do you think both of it is good? The game is almost done, we just have to figure out how to play accurately. So what do you guys think? What to do? One of our final questions. Um, to give you um, of like an estimate with um, what engines think, from what I checked, it's um, black is slightly better, but it's not black. Is, it's not like black is winning. Black is just like um, something around point. Uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 better, but it's still like you can see how dangerous it is. So, white still does have a chance of um, not losing this, so just have to play it accurately. Uh, I think f3 is good, but the problem with f3 is g4, and g4 is blocking my king's entrance. And I did not really want to deal with that, I wanted to keep my king activated, so I took this. And so, whoa, a lot of F3s. Ever, did anybody actually say taking on E3? Wow. Ha! Huh. Well, good to surprise you, right? F3 is alright, it's not like a losing move, but it does give white the chance to play G4 and block my king's entrance. So that is why we shouldn't do F3, unless you want to um, kind of deal with a little bit of disappointment of not being able to get your king in, but taking is the best one. It's kind of easy. After take, my idea is clear. I'm just going to bring in the king, and after king e5, or, oops, that is a blunder. This rook d5 checks don't really work either. So best move for white was actually to try to play rook e1. I would push the king, uh, wanting to go up here. Um, he most likely, well, most accurate move for white would be to try with h4, to just kind of mess with my pawn structure. Um, now if g4, then there's g3, which kind of blocks the king again. So there's a lot of, there's still a good fight left for white, but white kind of ignores the king side and center and just went for the queen side, which was a huge mistake. White shouldn't have done that. Now in this position, actually the winning move for black is c4, because you are simply going to start marching with everything you got. But I was very happy that my king is finally free to go to the attack, so I just pushed the king. Um, it wasn't the most accurate move, so I'm telling you to know that you don't always have to do the, the best moves, the most accurate ones, but you do have to have a, an idea, a path to follow. So, king e5 b7, rook b8, and so one final question, black to move, what should we do? Should we keep pushing in the king? Should we push any pawn? One, that's our final question, and I will show you the accurate way. Ooh, nice, I got a c4, good one, thanks. What else? Okay, I think so. Everybody is kind of happy with c4. Yeah. e2 is also great. Yeah, e2 is uh, even a little more accurate than c4 because rook e1, you just bring in the king 
Uh, so you sacrificed your extra pawn for the benefits of your other pawns. So now you can just relax and you can just give this guy up and just push. Well, actually, you can just push the king. This is super winning. You're going to get that. Um, however, in the game, I just went for c4 and root king here, take, and just e2, just get the king, and here my opponent resigned. So my point of showing you this game was to um, share with you that you don't always have to get out of the opening in like a super winning way, or you don't have to just um, always have the upper hand in the game. In this game, as you saw, um, uh, the opening, after coming out of the opening, everything was pretty uh, even. Pawn structures was uh, slightly different because I had the king side majority, he had the queen side majority. Um, and some of the other things to think about is the technique. I, mm, I knew what I was doing. I knew I wanted to activate my king. I knew I wanted to not to let my opponent activate his pieces. So, and yes, the point of the game was to play g5, of course. So, yeah. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this game. It was one of my... It was just one of those games that um, you played beautiful and your opponent didn't really do like a huge blunder or like a... He just like maybe the second best moves or not as accurate. So, yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, with that note, I am going to hand you off to um, my other coach from SLU, VAR. So, make sure to go watch his class of Insane and Endgame, and yeah, tell him I said hi.